is basically a place where um, those who were in leadership of nonprofits could come together and actually unpack and discuss what they may have learned in training. Because unfortunately, training just keeps you at the intellectual level most of the time, but doesn't give the opportunity to go to the heart for you to really start to internalize what you may have learned. Uh, that was about 10 years ago, and as an all-volunteer organization, it went from basically two co-leagues trying to reach out to the community, organize training, have uh, kind of being a, a clearinghouse of information for its members, to now we are seven, six, six um, leadership members strong, and still having the same challenges <laughs> as two people, of really getting this out to folks and providing opportunities for learning and discussion. We meet monthly, those uh, meetings are, are free and open to the public, and we're trying to have a more robust, robust training schedule. Right now we're at least at quarterly that are for our members only. And we've grown beyond just being for nonprofits. There are community members, there are for-profit, and a few uh, governmental agency folks. Anybody who wants to have the mission of uh, eliminating institutional racism, they're more than welcome. And recognizing that it takes all of us to do that. Not one sector, not one business, not one size of business is really going to be able to figure this out. It's all hands on deck. And recognizing that our community is all of us. It's not, we have to get out of the silos of this community, that community, and those types of things. And recognize that we're in this together. So that's really brief. We're more than happy to provide more information about ourselves and in part, but we really want to take time today to hear your voices and have the opportunity to learn amongst the group. Um, that really being our purpose of the day is to raise our awareness and understanding around how higher education specifically um, plays its role and contributes to structural racism as an institution. Uh, just a few group agreements that we usually like to have. First is the self-care. Um, those that were in here as the chairs were being set up, we just request that if you want to sit on the floor, if you want to stand, if the chair's not comfortable, whatever it is that you physically need to be com as comfortable as you can be without being disruptive or sitting on someone's head or you know, something like that, um, we ask that you please do it. Um, that does include going to the restroom if you need it or drink water, but also recognizing that self-care is about emotional and mental as well. We are holistic beings. So if something it gets a little tough for you, we want this to be the place that you, you can address it. Understanding that you may not be able to verbally be able to address it, but you, you may have some other way of self-care, and we want you to be able to do that. That may mean stepping out for a moment, that may mean speaking to either of us or one of your peers in the room. We want to be able to respect that there's various ways of self-care, and it's not just about our physical space, it's also about our mental and emotional. Next, that um, we believe in making this space a courageous space. Um, some of us are not safe anywhere in the world, so calling it a safe space is offensive and not obtainable for some of us. So we prefer to say a courageous space, because all of us are taking some risk, either by being here, by speaking up, sharing our stories, or even willing to say, questioning why we may feel some way and how that may differ from someone else. Do you want to go over the other two? Uh, sure. Um, so uh, we definitely want folks to consider how much space you're taking up in the room, and I mean that metaphorically, obviously in the sense of the way that you are uh, expressing yourself. So are you um, someone who talks a lot? <laughs> then you need to, um, we're asking folks that you kind of make sure that you're making space for others to speak. And that means pausing for a little longer than just one beat. Like give the people who are a little slower to uh, raise their hands or a little slower to um, formulate a thought a chance to speak. Um, so consider like if you've already spoken a couple of times, it might be time for you to hang back and, and wait to see if others have something important to contribute as well. Um, and of course, the step up part of, of that is 
Uh, on the other hand, if you're one of those quieter people, you know, try to sort of push yourself to to step up and and speak and engage and you know really um, be be involved in the in the dialogue. Um, okay, so you talked about self care. So the going back to number one, I think we didn't talk about yet. So we want folks to practice this idea of withholding judgment. So you hear somebody say something that you disagree with. Um, we're asking that you kind of try to recognize that other, that multiple truths are possible at the same time. And hold that space for them, their truth being true at the same time as your truth is true. And try not to judge it, just try to let it be. Um, and allow yourself to sit in discomfort. These conversations are not comfortable. Ever. Regent and I are really good friends, and it's still, some of them are easier, but sometimes when we are, you know, kind of checking each other or whatever, it's hard. They're not comfortable. Um, and so allow yourself to sit in that discomfort. And one of the things that sort of happens around white privilege is that white people tend to be like, oh, I don't like this conversation, and they just check out, whether that's physically leaving the room or more mentally check out, as in, you know, I just can't, I'm not going to engage. Um, and so, again, so challenge yourself to sit in that discomfort. Um, and um, allow yourself to learn and grow out of the discomfort. And I don't mean out of it as in like get out of it, I mean because of the discomfort. Uh, anything you want to add? Mm -hmm. No, I think that's pretty good. Yeah. Are those acceptable to everybody? And if is there something that you need to add to be present in this space while we're together today? Um, yeah. There's something I'd like to ask. I'm sorry, I was just a little over 10 minutes late, but uh, did you did you say already what, how you define institutional racism? No, we haven't gotten there. We're, that's next. <laughs> the other thing is I recognize, you know, people are going to have to go to class. We're probably going to go at least until 1, but if you got to leave at 12.50, you know, go right ahead and sneak out. We recognize, we won't take it personally. <laughs> <laughs> There's never enough time. Right. Yeah. Okay, so we're skipping this one. Oh, and we did that already? Okay. So I'm going to do that. Oh, I can't do that part. No, I can do it. I'll do it. I'm going to practice. Because our time is really, really short today, we um, normally have full definitions on the, the, how the whole structure comes together. Um, structural racism is the interplay of the, uh, the other manifestations. Today we're really going to talk about institutional, uh, meaning that education is an institute of that. There's also cultural and interpersonal, and how all of those tie together in to build our social norm structure that perpetuates racism and other forms of oppression. Um, all of these forms are, just, are intact and functioning for all forms of oppression. There, is, there isn't one form of oppression that, that doesn't have some institutional basis or have some cultural basis. So um, understanding how that structure works together, it's like a three-legged stool, and the, the structure is the seat that the oppression sits in. Um, for today, our definition of institutional racism is uh, the textbook definition, a form of racism that is structured into political and social institutions that are practiced through laws, customs, traditions, and practices that systematically result in racial inequities in a society. So in um, normal conversation terms, my, my interpretation of that definition is um, the policies, procedures, and practices and social norms that are embedded in our social institutions, so education, um, police, criminal justice, banking, food systems, uh, an, an entire system of a social function that uh, perpetuates inequities or leads to different life outcomes. And race has been the number one leader in all of the social outcomes, where other forms of oppression may or may not have as 
severe or disproportionate outcomes. Did you want to expand on that at all? Um, no, but that that's that what the last thing Regent just said is why we focus on race, why we start with race. Because very often I I get asked the question like, well, what about gender? Or what about sexual orientation or you know, anything else? Um, and the answer to that is that the inequities are clearly um, stronger, bigger, um, when you look at race. Um, and there's some really, there's some studies that look at sort of like the intersection of gender and race and still find that um, the, wait, what's the, the women, the white women fare better than either of the people of color groups. So that's how you know race is the strongest. Are you going to have this um, some of this available after the presentation? Absolutely. So we won't have. Yeah. Them. I want to listen to where they're trying to take notes. Yeah. Very yeah. Thank but you. We'll we'll provide it to Kimberly, okay. and um, I'm not sure if you'll have it on the website. Or yeah. We'll have it on our library's website in the library guide, and I can send out the email with that information. Great. Yeah. We'll make sure. And there is one handout. Yeah. Gonna, we don't have enough copies, so you'll have to share. It. Okay. It has some of this. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for asking. Um, the next th that we want to talk about today is interpersonal racism because um, for the, the reason of our discussion, within the institutions, there are the people. Uh, the people who take part of, create, run, are part of the, the embedded culture of that institution. So that's where the in interpersonal relationships come into play. And our, textbook definition for this is the beliefs, social attitudes, actions, beha and behaviors of individuals that support or perpetuate racism. Individual racism can occur on both a conscious and unconscious level. So um, has anyone heard the term implicit bias? That's kind of a buzzword right now. Um, and it talks about how most of our racist thinking, so to speak, is unconscious and is happening on a level that we aren't even aware of in most of the cases. Something like that would be walking on the other side of the street when you see someone of a different race or a group of folks. Um, also, uh, one that actually happened to me uh, yesterday is um, being a part of a group doing some hiring and seeing a name and assuming that that person is either of a different race or a poverty level, mm -hmm. or seeing someone's zip code and making those type of assumptions. Um, it becomes explicit bias when you actually act on it or you actually say the words. It's often that we aren't aware of those type of biases, but they have the exact same impact racially. Um, it impacts how folks go through the education system, where they buy their homes, their outcomes in food systems, or in healthcare. So even um, that special brand of Seattle racism that says that, no, we're not racist, the impacts of it is exactly the same. So uh, one key point that I like to add about this is if you do a survey and you ask sort of like Americans across the country, uh, white Americans across the country, you know, are, are you, do you support uh, racial equity? 85% uh, of people say yes. Again, these are white Americans. Um, but then you give them an, uh, an uh, implicit association test or an unconscious bias test, and we find that the exact same people who say they are not racist are displaying unconscious or implicit bias. Um, and so it's really important to understand that because one of the problems I think with the way we've been doing sort of social justice um, education for a long time is that we were always telling people like, how to handle when someone says a racist comment? What do you do? What do you say? How do you confront them, right? And how do you handle when someone confronts you about something you've done or said? And that's not bad, but it's too limiting because the reality is most of us aren't doing it because we're bigots. Most of us are doing it because it's so perpetu uh, it's so ingrained in us, and it's so there's a word uh, socialized. It's so socialized. It's like the stupid. It's like the water we swim in. We don't even realize that it's there. 
Um, yeah, normal. There's a word I'm looking for that's not coming to me, but that's okay. Um, anyway, and then it's also why uh, in my work I've started shifting the um, conversation a lot more to the institutional racism, because you get that one or two people in an organization who are um, really recognizing the problems, and they'll start to try to make change in the organization, but if it doesn't get institutionalized in the policy practices and procedures level of the organization, the organization doesn't change. As soon as that person leaves, it goes right back to normal. Normal. Excuse me. Bad choice of words there. But it, it sort of uh, reverts back to the um, default. racist default yeah. system. Yes. And also recognizing that um, this implicit bias, is it's not just white folks against everybody else. As people of color born in America, we are also socialized in a, in a lot of those structures and biased beliefs. It's internalized racial oppression. And so the test that Robin was speaking of, I give quite often in, in my workshops, and I myself have taken it 12 times. <laughs> and the first time that I took it, I had a, a kind of a favoritism towards uh, black folks, which I am. All 11 subsequent times, I've had a favoritism towards white. So recognizing even though that I have been intentionally on this journey to kind of repath myself, being in a society that is constantly bombarding us with the socialization of white supremacy, that even as a black woman, I, I'm still unconsciously perpetuating those ideas. So recognizing that, again, that the, this work towards racial, racial equity, we all have a journey to go on that road. We all have some retraining and some untraining to do. And by having these conversations, this helps us be able to deepen our new habits and our new thinking. Ready for this? Do the next one. Um, so, I feel like Regent has pretty much already made this clear, because um, she said quite a bit about it already, but um, we sort of see structural racism as being held up by all of these institutions, right? So that's why it was the middle triangle, and that's um, what differentiates structural racism from the institutional racism, is that it's now the, the history and the combination of all the various institutions. And this is some, we could have, we could have probably come up with like a dozen more, um, but this is a pretty common list of some of the types of institutions that buttress um, structural racism or create structural racism. Yeah. Okay, all right, I don't have enough copies, so I'm gonna ask that pretty much you kind of try to take one every other person and then look at the uh, over the shoulder of the other person next to you or whatever. Um, and can I get six volunteers to read? We're gonna read it really quickly. I don't wanna spend a ton of time on this because I don't want us to waste, uh, not waste, but um, lose time on the dialogue part. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, I don't quite remember. Um, uh, should you know who you are? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Okay. okay. Can you please be the narrator? Where was number two? Who was number two? Can you please be Jessica? Where was number three? Okay. You're one of them. Okay, you be Cardo. I mean, you be Gail. You were one of the volunteers, right? You be Brandon, and you be Diego. Okay, got it? You yeah. Diego. For doing these, please don't try to act the part. We're just asking you to simply read the part. Yeah, just simply read the part. Let's not sort of add insult to injury by trying to act like what we think the parts are. Okay, everybody else just sort of listen and read along. And what we're going to be looking for here, and again, quickly at the end, we're going to talk about the part, those three definitions of racism, um, where we see instances of those in this. Okay, so I think I said narrator. Uh, recent media reported that only about half of African American, Latino, and Native American students graduate from Seattle public schools. While some Asian populations graduate at rates higher than white students, Asian Pacific Islander students are known to graduate at lower rates, but there is little data on these disparities. Gail, who is African American, and her boyfriend Diego are raising their child, who they had, been, who they had when they were 15. She lives with her parents at Yesler Terrace, a public housing project, and attends Garfield High School. 
Due to occupancy standards, Diego cannot live with them. Diego, who is from El Salvador, recently dropped out of Garfield. He works evenings at a gas station near her school, which allows him to care for his daughter during the day while Gail goes to school. He meets them at school for lunch each day so they can have family time. Should I read the next paragraph? Yep. Recently, Diego was arrested for selling marijuana, which he justified as a way to provide necessary income for his family since his job only pays minimum wage. Gail is struggling to both maintain her grades and keep her attendance up due to child care needs. Gail is in a meeting with the school social worker, Jessica, who is white, and her favorite teacher, Carlos, who is Filipino. Carlos is one of the few teachers of color at her school. I wanted to start by saying what a strength it is that you have stayed in school. Most girls in your position would have dropped out sooner. Unfortunately, we're here today to talk about your violations of the district's attendance policy. Once again, you have had more than seven unexcused absences in this past month. We have to refer to, to juvenile court for a truancy report. <coughs> this will require you to go to a truancy workshop. Gail, I would love for you to stay in school, but your absences are affecting our classrooms and your grades. It seems like you need to either get your act together or consider dropping out of school. Have you thought about getting a GED instead? I know I need a real high school diploma. How can I attend a truancy workshop? I barely have time to make it to school. Diego and I are working hard are working on to make sure I graduate. I just took one for a year. Don't you believe he's well enough to do it? Well, from the recent thing I heard about Diego, I fear he may be more a part of your problem than a solution for you. You're the narrator. Oh, yeah, sorry. Gail leaves the meeting feeling defeated. She runs into Brandon, a white student who is a leader in <coughs> student government. Wow, I was bummed to hear about Diego. Without him, none of us would have, would have access to all this great stuff we, we get from him. How is he doing? His court date is this afternoon, so he'll finally get out of juvenile detention. Hopefully he'll still have his job. Looks like I may have to drop out now. Seems like I just don't have what it takes to graduate from high school. I'm sure you can. It takes some self-discipline and determination. Try harder, Gail. It's definitely a lot of work. You can, if I can support you tutoring, let me know. Thanks, I'm already part of the youth tutoring program down the street at Catholic Community Services. It's great when I can get there. I just need more talent here so I can go. After school, Gail hurries downtown to meet her parents at Diego's court <coughs> hearing. Afterwards, she and Diego are deciding how to move forward. This is impossible. It is my first offense, so they, so they say they let me out easy, but they gave me a soda. It means stay out of the drug area, so I, so I can't go within the block, within the three block area where I was arrested or I will violate my probation. The three blocks include where Garfield and Bridge are. Wow. Okay, not an uncommon story, by the way, and we borrowed this from the city of Seattle's Race and Social Justice Institute, and they created these based on real stories. So there's other ones, but this is the one we're focused on today. Um, so I guess I would just like to take maybe two or three hands per each one, um, or, or we just each one. Okay, so can you uh, give me an example of the individual racism you see happening here? Um, in the first paragraph under Jessica, it says um, most girls in your position would have dropped out sooner, which is really condescending, and it sort of puts, makes a hierarchy between the person who's talking to her, like they're in a parental position of some kind. Great. Yep. Thank you. Perfect. Anybody see any other individual racism moments? Yes. Well, I thought when the friend and said he were, that he could help with tutoring, kind of assumed she didn't. She's how to help you. Right, it assumes she's not smart enough, right. but really it's about yeah. time and support. Right. Yep, perfect. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Carlos was, uh, I get recommended uh, to drop out of school and get the GED instead. Yeah. Which is uh, so weird to recommend somebody to drop out of school. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> yes. And you can bet it happens desperately based on race every day. Okay, last one for individual. Yeah, the same thing with Carlos right before that. When he says, get your act together, it's a different meaning for her entire life. The things that she struggles with and just makes it this easy thing that she can just flip the switch at any time. Get your act together. Right. Yep. Okay, uh, the institutional racism. So remember, these are the policies and procedures, practices. That's not exactly the way it's defined on the slide, but it's the way it's defined here. Yes, in the left. Uh, when Jessica talks, she's talking more about the, the system and the rules that are within the system and caring about the, the individual predicament. 
So what's one of the rules that Jessica talks about? Uh, just the truancy, the inflexible absence. Yeah, so truancy numbers. law. Yeah. Truancy law is exactly one of the sort of institutional racist moments. Yeah. So what other systems or rules or policies do you see that are impacting? Yeah. Um, drug policy. Drug policies, right? So this guy can't even go to work now, right? Okay. Uh, one more? Yeah. Is there a housing policy? Housing so policy. The occupancy standards. Perfect. Thank you. Yes. Okay. So now the structural racism, again, is defined slightly differently in here than on the screen, but it's similar enough, right? How do these all kind of add up? What's the history, the current reality, and the combo of all these institutions together that define this structural racism that we're looking for? Yeah. This one's harder. It's definitely harder, which is why we wanted to do this activity. And I think it's started to come out in some of your answers already. Go ahead, in the plot, and then we'll come up. Um, just the institution that would have a, a white honor student be able to enjoy marijuana but not be in the mm -hmm. system to have to be in the selling part of that circle. Exactly, right? And that's the intersection of the schools with the criminal justice system and a whole lot of other stuff, but that's the most obvious connection there. She's, pro that she's profiled the other way, that she's, people are making assumptions about her without even stopping to ask what her situation is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's across all of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Her inability to access childcare. Yeah, her inability to access childcare, which then uh, impacts her ability to go to school, which impacts why Diego is selling marijuana in the first place, right? Okay, so again, lots of interactions there. Any others you want to point out? If you've done good, this, I mean, I'm not certain there are for more. as fast as. Yeah, for as fast as we're making you do this, you're doing excellent. <laughs> oh, yes. Diego not being able to have a better paying job. Right, exactly. Yeah. Better paying job, living with the people, you know, all that again. And I saw one more hand. Did you want to add? I was going to say, uh, he can no longer go to his work or to school because of his criminal justice issues, which can go back and back. This is it just leads to recidivism, and yes, you know, he's absolutely. more likely to violate again. And then mm -hmm. just the whole thing is just viciously cyclical. Oh. It just compounds on top of each other. Absolutely. And there's also the cultural piece at the very end, the friend that that was talking to her about just try harder mm -hmm. and, and that kind of piece of, of basically a standard that in dominant culture is whiteness of you know the pulling yourself up by your bootstraps just get it together um, as something that you can just get up one day and say hey I want to do better today and have that impact all those other systems in a way that this particular person doesn't have the opportunity to do it actually either of them I just noticed something. I'm, it could have been already mentioned, but that how um, the structure of it is like structure to just failure. But Carlos, their situation, she's also being Gail is kind of like being also punished because of the actions of. Even her boyfriend, where it says that one part, like, um, where you was it at? Right here, where it says that um, he's part of her problems. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And in some ways, like, the, in everything about it, every system, mm -hmm. everything about it is set up to make them fail. Mm -hmm. Them being mm -hmm. Gail and Carla. Mm -hmm. And recognizing the impact that that's going to have on their child. And that's what, yeah, you know, I was thinking about that, the change. Yep, the being, cycle. The, the child could get taken away, <coughs> issues in schooling and care, uh, what would be considered learning deficiencies if they're not having early childhood experiences. So it is generationally, uh, this simple scenario would have impacts on that. So um, just for the sake of time, wanting to move us forward, uh, that was just really a, a brief, which mm -hmm. as Robin stated, you, you were able to pull out so many things from that and recognizing that there's hundreds of these types of scenarios that happen on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. 
that obviously impact um, was different with age, um, but many of the type of barriers are still there, whether it's elementary school, high school, or college, or grad school, even if you get to that point. So recognizing that as we grow up, these <laughs> barriers are, are often not changing, um, as we may even increase our upward mobility financially, the barriers are still there. And um, really how can we start to, as the individuals and the interpersonal, start to take away some of those barriers for folks. So uh, the activity that we had planned will not work because <laughs> there's too many folks. Yeah, we're going to um, ask folks to get together in uh, smaller groups, um, four or five, I think, per group. And we have three questions that we, we'd like you to talk about in your group and um, just have a little opportunity to share your own experiences and learn from each other. And we invite you also to make sure that there's someone of a different either race or ethnicity than you in that group. Um, understanding that that doesn't always happen, but I'm, we're a pretty mixed group here. And I'm very pleased with that. We've done these with all one direction or the other. <laughs> so um, go ahead and group up and we'll come around and let you know what the three questions are. Okay. How do you group up? Hey. Yeah. 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 Right here. Just all this Um yeah, I, I'm filming this and the, the conversation. I so, um, because yeah. no, the the school actually. Okay. Yeah. So, the three questions we're going to have you focus on are, and try to let everybody speak, when, when was the first time you had a teacher of, uh, for white people, of a different race, and for people of color, the same race mm -hmm. as you, or uh, race or ethnicity as you? Okay, that's number one. The second one is, what is your understanding of the school to prison pipeline? And that can be both, I have no idea what that even means, or I understand it and this is school to prison pipeline. Uh, I see people going, um, or, and this is, if you do know something about it, you can say this is my understanding of what it is or how it works, okay, or what's happening. Pipeline. pipeline, as in there's a pipeline that channels things to other things, right? Like think about the oil pipeline that we're gonna build, right? So this is, how is it that schools are actually pipelining people of color into prison, is the basic question there, okay? Um, and the last one is, kind of trying to go move in the other direction, positivity. How, do you, how can you personally move racial equity forward? We are gonna write them up, um, but that, those are the three, so you can go ahead and get started. I'm 
far too often it is college when most of us, regardless of your race, either start experiencing teachers or professors that are black and Latino specifically and native depending on where you grow up. Uh, would anybody like to share basically of how, how did it feel to listen to other folks that are different than you? Recognizing me. Just got a couple of minutes left. Folks have to go, please. I thought it was really great and empowering. Um, and I just wanted to plug two books. One of them is Everything is Obvious by Duncan Watts. Yes. And he talks Good about plug. how our brains um, compartmentalize things and why it's so easy to put race into that program and have it spit out race. And the other one is called Whistling Vivaldi by Claude Steele, who's a black scholar, and he talks about stereotypes. Very crazy. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, one is Everything is Obvious, and it's by Duncan Watts. Duncan Watts. W A T T S. Yeah. The other one's Whistling Vivaldi. As in the musician, Vivaldi. Yes. Whistling, Whistling Vivaldi, the composer. Vivaldi. And it's by Claude Steele. Steele, S T E L. Whistling Vivaldi. Yeah. We will also make sure to have the, those, thank you for bringing that up, and some other resources for Kimberly to be on the library site. And again, just recognizing that this is where the work starts, having the conversation, sitting with the discomfort, and really hearing other folks that are different than you. And seeing what, you, there's so much more you have in common than you may have different. So thank you so very much. Uh, sorry it was so fast, but yes, love to have the audience. We'll be here for about five more minutes, so if you have any questions for us, we'll be here for a little bit. No, I appreciate it.